I'm going to be setting the scene for today. So I'm going to try and give you some examples of individuals' experiences of making use of the mental health pathway and some of the challenges that we are faced with when trying to obviously support troubled individuals who are dealing with stressful indicators in their life and that aren't always getting the right type of support at the right time to make that difference. So it's about us saying... Ending the discrimination in mental health. Turning off the crisis tap. To some people, they might say, well, what does that mean? And why has Penrose necessarily gotten involved in this? And I think I've been asked that question several times. And for me, it's about making a difference to individuals' lives. It's about giving people the opportunity to achieve what they want in their lives. It's not about Penrose saying to people who we work with, who are vulnerable, who need support, this is your journey, this is your pathway. It is about Penrose as an organisation listening to what an individual needs are and how then we respond will helpfully make the difference to them transitioning from a negative position in life to a positive one. Oops. So who are Penrose? So... To be honest, we've been going for over 45 years. Started off as a charity where two offenders left prison, didn't have anywhere to go, they were going to be homeless, they squatted in a house, you know, they, they got other prisoners to come along and join them, and then the local council said, actually, you're doing a good job there, guys, we're going to give you that property. And from those humble beginnings, my organisation, Penrose, was born. Now, the ethos hasn't really changed because it's about our vision for a society in which all vulnerable people have opportunities to change their lives positively for the better. Our mission is to give each of those individuals who are vulnerable, again, the opportunity to get back into society and to play a valuable role which is meaningful for them and the wider community. So the focus today is about looking at some of the past and present research, the impact and the cost that mental health services and the overutilization of those services can have on NHS, on our police force, ambulances, etc. And more importantly, to the individual and their families and the wider community. And then we're going to talk about moving forward, because I've been asked at many conferences that I've been before, you're not going to have another conference to talk about what the problems are, are you? And I say to them, no, this is going to be something that is focused on coming up with solutions. Jill touched on it earlier, and this is going to be a reoccurring theme. We are here to find solutions. So what do we know? What is the research telling us? 23% of inpatients in mental health um, wards or outpatients and community treatment orders are from ethnic minority groups. Detention rates under the Mental Health Act during 2012-2013, 6.6 times higher for black and other ethnic minority groups. Black African, black Caribbean and black and white mixed groups three times more likely to be admitted into hospital than the population as a whole. They are also 44% more likely to be sectioned, as, as we all know, without their consent. So there, there is obviously an issue, and this issue has been discussed time and time again. Over the last 30 years, there's been a multitude of different research that indicates that there is a problem. When we look at some of the, 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 those who have come before us, we have men of African-Caribbean origin are twice as more likely to be detained in low secure services than men of white British origin and stay for twice as long in those services. The question has to be asked, why? Every person with a mental health problem should be able to say, I'm not stigmatised by services and professionals, 
as a result of my health symptoms or my cultural ethnic background. The strengths of my culture and identity are recognized as part of my recovery and we collectively should recognize that that can bring strength to the individual and shouldn't be seen as a reason to marginalize. That was taken from the five-year forward view for mental health, the Mental Health Task Force, by one of our speakers today who will be alluding to that in more detail. Technical hitch. There we go. Other examples of research that has been done comes from our partners Breaking the Circles of Fear, the Sainsbury's Centre for Mental Health. They recommend that each health and social care community must ensure equal access and appropriate counselling and psychotherapy services are made available. That isn't always the case. Our experience tells us that individuals have to wait six to nine months to get a talking therapy opportunity. Now, what does the person do in that time when they're waiting six to nine months? Is that part of the solution or is that part of the problem? In order to break this cycle, it is necessary to address the issue from both perspectives of services by making primary care and other services more welcoming. What do we do to make sure that different groups feel that they can approach a particular service and get the support that they need? From the perspective of the black community, by increasing understanding and knowledge and reducing the stigma associated with mental illness, you'll have much better engagement in the process. And after all, early intervention has got to be better than trying to deal with a problem once it's fully entrenched. We've had promises made. For example, in 2014, the Joint Commissioning for Mental Health, co-chaired by the Royal College of General Practitioners and the Royal College of Psych Psychiatrists, under the 10 key messages for commissioners, are quoted as follows. Regardless of their ethnic background, everyone who uses a mental health service or cares for someone who, who does should have equitable access and effective interventions and equitable experiences and outcomes. Commissioners have a legal duty to ensure that this happens. I'll leave you to judge, decide whether that's actually been made a reality. We had a round table discussion. Penrose headed it up and we had some luminaries from the police, the ambulance, we had academics, we had activists, and we came up with eight key themes. And each one of those themes, once you hear them, you think, actually, that makes sense. Evidencing. Now, we looked at that from two perspectives. Not just because there's lots of evidence, but is how we are using that evidence to promote the need for change. Are we making sure that that evidence is reaching the right people who are the decision makers, who are the purse holders, and who are the ones that can make the real difference? Cultural awareness and trust. I know that many of the statutory services have invested in training for frontline staff. I know from our experiences that they are dedicated to improving their services so everyone gets an opportunity at a fair chance at receiving services and support to make the difference to their lives. But how are we making sure that that is continually being updated? How are we ensuring that we are learning from the mistakes that we've obviously had in the past? Influencing. We all need to be lobbying. We all need to be showing that this is a problem. This crisis tap needs to be turned off. So it's about speaking with those individuals, your MPs, your commissioners, your local councillors. These are the people that can make a difference locally, which can then translate to a wider agenda, which can then be spread nationally. But we're all in this together to make that difference. Education. Now, this was a real... Um, topic that was discussed at length because it was 
not just about educating people who are working in those services. It's about starting in schools, starting giving young people the skills and the tools to manage their mentality and their well-being much more effectively. It's about understanding that some of the drivers that lead to mentally being unwell start at a young age. And it's recognizing that and offering our young people an opportunity to learn those skills so that as they grow into adulthood, they grow effectively and they can contribute for themselves, their family, and to a wider community. I think that's a responsibility that we all should share and have. Then we're looking at things funding and governance. This is always the bugbearer. Where's the money going to come from? Who's going to fund these wonderful services? And that is going to be the challenge that we have today, tomorrow, next week, next year. We are living in times of auster austerity. So we have to be creative in how we can generate the funding to allow us to put those services on. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that we have to show value for money. We have to deliver quality services. We have to show the effect and the impact that the investment in these services will have to individuals, to their communities, and to the wider society as a whole. Service design. Many of you here will have been involved in services that support vulnerable people. And I'm sure you'll all join me in saying it's something that's never static. It's something that's always needing to be improved and built upon. And part of today is to look at what's happening currently and how can we build on that, improve on that, and hopefully come out with solutions to make that difference. Courage and prioritization. We've all got to have the courage of our conviction. You've shown your conviction by being here today. So that we need to make sure that as a force that we join together to come up with those solutions. But also we've got to also be courageous in understanding our own skills, our own delivery mechanisms might need to be improved. We need to recognise that some of the services that we have in our society aren't always geared to bring in positive changes in certain groups' lives. And if we can be own that, and have the courage to admit that, then we can move forward in developing solutions. Substance misuse. Now, today isn't going to be focused on substance misuse, but the roundtable acknowledged that that very often plays a crucial part in why an individual may develop a mental health condition, or indeed why that mental health condition is sustained. Things like the new forms of marijuana that is allowing people to develop psychosis and it's impacting on our young people the most. So we, whilst this isn't the focus for this conference, we acknowledge that it plays a part, so it has to be raised. So those were the eight themes that came out of the roundtable discussion. That was our starting point on this journey. From there, we went to meet with service users who had gone through the pathway, who had experienced some of the discrimination, who had their voices taken away from them and felt they didn't have an opportunity to raise their fears and their concerns. Don't you just love technology? Okay, so service users' voices, we got there in the end. So I'm just going to give you a few examples. So when I was arrested, I felt more targeted in a derogatory manner because of the color of my skin by white officers. I was spoken to rudely and offensively. A black person should just shut up. I was treated like an animal, forced medication and put on section. Hospital treatment was embarrassing, lonely and confusing. No one would listen to me. I was made fun of by the police and called stupid. A lot of Somalis are arrested whilst in mental health services, charged and sent to jail. I felt abused. I was held for 48 hours, not allowed to pray. 
I didn't see a doctor for some time with no medication. And I was not allowed to take that medication I actually had on me at the time. I was taken to hospital once. I finally got to see a doctor. I felt better there, and as I could pray and be calmer in myself. I felt discriminated against, not supported, and not listened to. These are regular themes that we are hearing about, being told about. When we work with our service users, this is what they're feeding back to us. Now, this has been going on for over 30 years. So again, it's time to turn off that crisis tap. I don't want, it to be, I don't want this conference to be seen as bashing any of the statutory services. We understand and appreciate some of the challenges that the ambulance are faced with, that the police are faced with, that our courts are faced with, and our prisons are faced with. All of our statutory services are struggling under times of austerity. But I am humbled by individuals from those services who are willing to stand up and acknowledge the courage to acknowledge that change needs to happen. And again, that's what today is about. We mentioned impact. And one of the key things we normally focus on is the financial impact, which we'll talk about. But I wanted to start off by talking about impact on the individual, the person that's dealing with that mental health diagnosis. Individuals being fearful within their own communities, being stigmatized and marginalized. Going for jobs seems like an impossible task very often because of the mental health condition and the diagnosis. Getting a home can be problematic. So sometimes our, our service users and those living with mental health diagnosis feel that they don't have a place in our society. People who are lost, struggling to find hope and meaning in their lives. And families driven apart by the failure to understand the diagnosis and how it impacts on that individual and them as a whole. But of course, if we are looking at impact, we couldn't forget the financial impact. And one of the things that really shocked me, at least one pound in every eight spent on long-term conditions is linked to poor mental health and well-being. Meaning that eight billion pounds and 13 billion of NHS spending is diverted into funding mental health and well-being services. That's a lot of money. And we could utilize that funding in other ways to bring other um, securities to our communities. Early intervention, prevention can help to reduce those costs. And I'm hoping part of today we will look at ways that we can do that. Bring people opportunities to change their lives. So, moving forward. Today isn't about me, as I'm sure you all know. This is a chance for us to have an opportunity to find a solution to turn off that crisis tap. And I want to start off by saying thank you for listening to me today. And hopefully you'll get involved in the different workshops that we've got. And you'll talk to each other, network with each other, come up with solutions, because that's what we're all here to do today. <laughs>